Well, ahead of the State of the Nation address, there's a number of questions about the signals that President Cyril Ramaphosa may give about energy and the climate. You know, that, well, I could call it an argument, but I think massive argument is better around the plans to explore for oil and gas off our coast. The Energy and Mineral Resources, Mr. Guido Mantasha, says that people who, ex who oppose this exploration are anti-development, that they don't want our country to develop. At the same time, there are many scientists, well, in fact, almost all of them, who say we don't need the oil and gas and that renewable energy can give us enough electricity. Dr. Vishwas Sakkar is an activist of the Climate Justice Charter Movement. Dr. Sakkar, good afternoon to you. You oppose this exploration. In fact, you're very critical, critical of Minister Mantashe. You're very critical of the company that wants to do this. Why? So it's not me alone, Stephen. It's uh, small-scale fishers who stand to lose a lot if our oceans are... Um, polluted, but also in the context of seismic surveys, there's clear disturbances with uh, aquamarine life along our coastlines. And there's, there's ample empirical testimony around this since seismic testing began. But more than that, there's a larger movement um, in South Africa that's rising against, if you like, um, a shallow approach to the climate crisis. Our government is committed to uh, narrow by 2050, and it has done that in the context of not having a clear climate justice or a just transition plan for South Africa. In the context of that lacuna, we are seeing Minister Gwede Mantash operate. And it's in this context uh, that his statements, his derisive statements, uh, against uh, small-scale fishers, against coastal communities, against the rising climate justice charter movement, are completely uh, inappropriate. Now, if you look at the current context in South Africa, the high level of inequality, we are one of the most unequal countries in the world. Uh, our economy is sitting at a 46% unemployment rate, uh, almost um, one of the highest in the world. Uh, we have a very, very serious crisis of social reproduction. Now, this is the result of Gwede Mantasha's ruling party and government in power. They have brought our society into a state of disaster. That's what we are living through. So when he talks about development and he talks about us being against uh, addressing these issues, he's fundamentally wrong. Actually, the policies that he is championing uh, for the continued use of oil, coal, and gas in our energy mix, car power ships, even alluding to nuclear and, of course, offshore extraction, are essentially a systemic risk for us. What we have seen over the past few years are increasing climate extremes and shocks on our society and in the region. Our drought cost us billions of rands. It had a major impact on GDP. The IMF even says Africa, as temperatures go up, most African economies will lose anywhere between 1 and 2 percent of GDP between a 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius increase. So the more that Mantash pushes in this direction, the more it's going to come back at us as cyclones, it's going to come back at us as tornadoes, heat waves, droughts, etc. And this for us is the irrationality of the position of Gwede Mantash. It's about climate injustice. It's, it doesn't have a case, if you like, because we do know that we can go the path of renewable energy. Costs have been coming down dramatically. We know that uh, modeling has been done. Uh, for example, wind, uh, offshore wind can supply eight times the current power that we have in South Africa. But essentially, we are trapped. We are trapped in this uh, minerals energy complex, and the likes of Gwede Mantash and others have material interests in the reproduction of the system. Okay, so, so I mean, I understand the argument. Let me pretend to be Gwede Mantash. Some people call me SG um, for a moment. And to put it in a way like this. So the argument would go, what you say may be correct, but we have millions upon millions of people who are unemployed. And one thing you can do economically to boost an economy is to cheapen the cost of energy. We all know electricity is very expensive. We find oil and gas in large quantities. Probably two things will happen. People will be employed in those communities to go and get the oil and gas. These will be South Africans with higher incomes than they have now. Two, the price of electricity would go down, which means the whole economy would be a boost, we would have more development, a lot more people would be employed. How would you respond to that? International research shows that offshore oil and gas extraction, including fracking, by the way, does not create large amounts of jobs. It's normally overinflated, its, its projections are exaggerated, etc. So I think that's the first point we must register in this conversation. These are not employment-creating opportunities. 
I think the second point about energy and the energy transition for South Africa, I think this is where we've got to locate it in the context of the lack of a just transition plan from government. Because if we really start taking into account the economic advantages, uh, the technical advantages of renewable energy systems, South Africa could actually, if you like, leapfrog in so many ways. And it can adjust its cost structure with renewable energies and actually bring down its cost structure with renewable energy. We've seen glimpses of this with the uptake, for example, in our competitive bidding system. It's been one of the most successful sort of inward investment uh, uh, strategies. Of course, there are limits to this because we also want it to go beyond just benefiting uh, foreign direct investors. We also want to ensure that communities uh, and um, society at large benefits through socially owned renewable energy and so on. But again, there is, if you like, an amazing opportunity here for us to restructure our energy system, but at the same time, restructure our economy to move in the direction of decarbonization and create uh, millions of climate jobs, which are very beneficial for our society. We can at the same time engage in building adaptive systems. Now, you know, we've done some work on various things. We've done work on food sovereignty, uh, on solidarity economy, etc. There's so much that can happen in this, on zero waste. I mean, our waste industry is worth, worth billions, and yet it's long to some kind of leakage, and it's not benefiting society. So again, if we close those loops, if we bring those things together, we could have a society that's on a much more resilient, a much more sustainable ground. It's addressing issues of inequality, unemployment, and, of course, the cost structure of our economy. So there are, if you like, viable alternatives. But the direction that Mantash is taking us in, together with, by the way, investors like Hoskins Consolidated uh, Investments, uh, is to really reinforce the crisis of our economy and our okay. society. Okay. So, 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 I mean, I understand the argument you say, and you're not the only person who says this, that there's enough renewable energy that we would be able to rely on that. But is the technology really there yet? I mean, sure, there may be enough wind available across the country if you have, you know, a windmill literally almost everywhere, and maybe that's what we should do if you have solar panels literally everywhere. But we just aren't there yet. I mean, we aren't there to sort out the baseload power system either, would go the argument. So again, if the government was ahead of the curve, it would be planning energy transition, but it would do it in a way that's not just narrowly centered on energy. It would have a more holistic view of our economy. South Africa has had amazing, if you like, uh, comparative advantages in its manufacturing and its manufacturing capability. The ANC government has actually made policy choices that have been shrinking our manufacturing capability big time. Uh, and as a result, we are losing a lot of ground in terms of uh, producing our own energy technologies. I mean, you take Denal, for example. Denal has been looted. It has incredible engineering and other kinds of specialized capabilities. In the context of the climate crisis, Denel could be at the front line of, if you like, being repurposed and producing uh, vehicles that we need for emergencies. It could be at the front lines of producing our public transport system. It could be at the front line, actually, of innovating uh, renewable energy technologies. Uh, there are so many, if you like, partnerships that the government could have with various segments of our manufacturing industry. Uh, you know, the government talks developmental state. It talks about bringing back manufacturing. But here's the opportunity. Marry the climate crisis and the needs of the country, and we could have ecocentric manufacturing, including creating climate jobs in that process. So, again, the government is coming short. It has this very, very narrow view of the economy, uh, and as I've been arguing, it's really about locked-in interests. Why do you believe it doesn't happen? You talk about locked-in interests. You're making a claim. Come on, come clean with your claim. So, you know, there's been, there's been a lot of, if you like, exposure now. The country knows. So if you look at the build of Kusile and Madupi, um, Tebe investments um, linked to Hitachi, etc., linked to the ANC, we're all implicated in that. So, you know, the first round of mega build of these coal-fired power stations revealed a lot to us around who was benefiting and why this was an imperative for the government. We've also seen, again, that nexus of relationships, this time with Shell, uh, ensure some kind of uh, sort of benefit to the ANC. Over the past two months, Business Day and various other newspapers have reported 
about 15 million rands being transferred out of that nexus uh, to the ANC to deal with its financial problems. So you have that evidence, um, and I think it's very, very compelling, and I think it's very strong. At the same time, if you look at Hoskins Consolidated Investments, for example, um, it is linked to the South African clothing and textile workers industry. It has interest in offshore oil and gas extraction. It has investments in coal, for example. And that coal has been supplying um, Eskom, and it now has a strong interest uh, through impact oil in the offshore extraction uh, initiative that's underway. So again, you have these interests that are very, very close to the ruling party. There are a whole host of other mining companies, etc., uh, that are invested in the coal economy. Uh, that have uh, links and connections uh, directly or indirectly with the ruling party. So these are the lock-ins that I'm talking about, and they are very, very serious uh, because what they do is they eclipse uh, the other options that we need to take more seriously. Uh, they bring to bear the power of the interest. I mean, the minister has gone on public uh, platforms uh, decrying the activism that's there. Uh, he's declared us pariahs in this society, uh, and he's closed down any debate or conversation about what we represent uh, and, and what we think is important for the country. Um, there's a lot that's going on with this. Is it also not true that other countries are battling with this change? So, for example, the European Union, I understand, is now looking at reclassifying gas as a form of electricity in a carbon neutral way and the reason they're doing this is because banks at the moment are not are not going to fund people who are mining for coal they're not going to fund coal-fired power stations but the eu is going to change the classification of gas because it actually does according to their science produce less pollution than oil and so that will allow then more investment in gas don't we actually have to be quite careful with the changes that we make what you're talking about and and you know, Dr. Zakhar, I don't, I don't disagree with you, uh, sort of, but I don't, um, mm -hmm. is that what you're also then dealing with is, is the concept of a just transition. You're going to take half of the economy of Mpumalanga and just say we don't need you anymore. So it's, it's not as dramatic as that. So as it is, it been is saying, if you're in Mpumalanga. <laughs> <laughs> we need a strategic approach to the just transition. That's our argument, okay? And it has to be sequenced. Uh, it has to make sure that things are lined up and they add up. And that's where we are coming from. Now, we are very different from Europe. We have a history of using coal for 100 years. We cannot continue using coal given its implications in, if you like, systemic risk, not just to South Africa, but also to our continent. I mean, over 100 million Africans will be displaced by increasing climate shocks, okay? And if we continue using oil, coal, and gas, we are going to be responsible for that. Uh, in addition to uh, what I've been describing as injustices in our society. So there's a very, very serious moral, ethical, and political imperative that has to be balanced in our just transition. So that's the first point I make. I think the second important point that I want to make is that, yes, you're right, uh, gas is a bridging technology. It cuts carbon emissions by half. But again, it doesn't, if you like, take us uh, quickly into that just transition that we need. You're going to then have a lock-in. You're going to have massive investments in gas infrastructure. Uh, you're going to have very powerful vested interests, et cetera, et cetera. And that's going to be a big battle for us. So from that perspective, and given the, the, the resource curse that goes with these resources, uh, South Africa doesn't have the conditions, if you like, to have an appropriate governance regime for gas. It will be a disaster for this country. The third point I want to make is that I think the way we are thinking about the energy transition uh, for South Africa, it does require us planning and evolving our system. Uh, there's enough evidence, there's enough comparative research, et cetera, available for us to think differently about our energy mix and our energy choices. I mean, we are confounded by why there's a ceiling on renewable energy. There isn't an economic argument. Uh, there isn't a climate argument. There isn't a policy argument against lifting that ceiling. And it can be done in a way, by the way, that can even evolve ESCOM in this process. But again, we don't have forward-looking leadership. Um, it's very unlikely that the president is going to take this problem by the bullhorns and provide leadership tomorrow. You're going to have incoherence. You're going to have inconsistencies coming from the State of the Nation address. And again, we are going to be in, a, uh, in limbo as a country in the midst of a worsening climate crisis, sadly.
Dr. Vishwa Sadkar, strong view, I did expect it, activists in the climate justice charter movement, I do appreciate the time. Thank you very much indeed. There are